All right, can you see my screen, guys? Yes. Alright, so in today's class probably I talk about this up to this part actually the rotational kinetic energy of system which we express that kr would be half of i omega square, right? So, where yes, sir. this i is basically the moment of inertia and this omega is actually the angular velocity. We derived that part in your class today, actually. And I also said that if the system has only that rotational, that's when the system is rotating only, its center of mass is not moving. In that case, it has only this rotational kinetic energy. If the system is moving instead of rotating then it has only that translational kinetic energy that's we write half of m v square if the system has both type of motion then uh, its total kinetic energy will be kinetic energy from translational part and the kinetic energy from rotational part which i write half of m v square plus half of i omega square that's actually known as total kinetic energy of the system for the rolling motion. This is also called that rolling motion. Rolling motion. So, or sometimes we also we say that this is actually that pure rolling motion when the system has translational as well as rotational kinetic energy. The system has pure rolling motion. We say in that way. Alright, then we also introduce the idea, let us say uh, I have a system, uh, let us say that there are two dicks, one dicks actually let us say the P and another dicks actually that, I am sorry, so another dicks actually that is a Q is connected in that way. So, this is the dx q and this is the mass of this dx p is m 1 and the radius is let us say the r 1. This is the mass of the dx q m 2 and the radius actually that r 2. This m 1 is given actually this let us say this m 1 is actually 4 gram m2 is 6 gram, r1 is 1 centimeter, r2 actually 1.5 centimeter. Then the whole system I am going to rotate about this point over here, let us say this is the point A. If I want to rotate that system about that point, at a angular velocity, let us say that angular velocity is given which is omega actually 2 rad per second, then how much energy I needed to uh, rotate that system at a angular velocity 2 rad per second. Alright, so when I am going to rotate that system about this point or rotational point in that way, these two system will be rotated at the same angular velocity omega which is 2 rad per second over here. Since it is a connected over here, it is a composite object I make by these two digs. Then I will write down it is basically the rotational energy I am supposed to write it should be a half of i omega square where this i would be the moment of inertia for this composite, composite system about the point A. Then I am supposed to write this I A should be the moment of inertia of the object P about the point A plus the moment of inertia of object Q about the point A. Yeah, is there any question over here? Someone probably give me the message. 
Yes, uh, Jamil, I know that one. Sir, uh, someone is trying to join the meeting. Sir, uh, Zarin is trying to join the meeting, but uh, she is unable to. Can you accept her? Yes, I accept already her, actually. Yeah, give me that. Uh, thank you very much, Tawhid. Thank you very much. Yeah, Jamil, I know that I already uh, done in your section, but I'm trying to give you a... Uh, uh, because I didn't do probably the other section, actually, for this part. So that's why I'm doing it again for so that you can give a flashback of this part actually. All right, Jamin. All right, so then this is would be actually your total moment of inertia of the system throughout the point A. All right. So then what is that moment of inertia of the object P about the point A? Look at this, this object, which is the disk over here, uh, this one is already is rotating about the center of mass which is the A over here. So that's why I'll write down that moment of inertia for this system object P or the digs P about the point center of mass is supposed to be half of m1 r1 square because if you have a dx which has a mass is m and the radius is r then the moment of inertia for this dx throughout the center of mass should be half of m r square i'm using that idea over here because this dx has a mass m1 and the radius is the r1 it is rotating about the center of mass so that's why this would be the moment of inertia for this object P or the dx P. Fine. Now, what about that moment of inertia of the Q about the point A? Now, for the Q has a moment of inertia throughout the center of mass, that should be a half of m2 r2 square, but it is rotating a axis which is parallel to that axis. This is my new rotational axis, which is parallel to this center of mass axis, but it is a distance at that one. So that's when I'm going to use that parallel axis theorem over here. So parallel axis theorem is telling me that what is that parallel axis theorem? That parallel axis theorem was uh, moment of inertia throughout any axis. It should be moment of inertia of the system throughout the center of mass plus m d square. All right, so that's the formula to find out the moment of inertia using the parallel axis theorem. Right now for the Q, the mass is M2, radius is R2, then I'm supposed to write the moment of inertia through the center of mass, actually half of M2, R2 square plus M2, that's the mass of this object. Now the distance from center of mass to new rotational axis, basically this one, that would be R1 plus R2, right? I'll simply write down this thing over here is going to be R1 plus R2 square. Now I know the everything over here. I know M1, R1, I know M2, R2, right? If I plug in those things, I'll find out the total moment of inertia, which is the system. The moment of inertia of this system is going to be, if you add those two things, you will find out simply just plug in those values, you will find out the moment of inertia for this system is going to be 4.62 into 10 to the power minus 6 kg meter square. So that's the moment of inertia for this system. Now if you know that moment of inertia, you can find out that how much energy is required to rotate at an angular velocity 2 rad per second square. That should be half of i omega square. Then if you plug in those values, because your omega is 2 and i is this one, then you will find out that kinetic energy is going to be 9.25 into 10 to the minus 6 joules. So that would be basically that rotational kinetic energy of that system. All right, so that's what actually we introduced in our class up to today. All right, now let's go to for the dynamic part actually. So dynamic part I introduced up to basically the torque. So, torque we define actually the torque 
we write express that is basically r cross f right so and we can also write down so this torque is going to be r f sin theta since is a uh, cross product the angle between these two would be the sine ratio basically over here this theta is the angle between these two vector r and the f i already talked about this thing in your class today right and then i also uh, introduce a relation between the torque and that uh, angular acceleration which I shown you which is this net torque would be uh, I alpha right did I talk in both section up to this yeah from section 1 Sharika did I discuss this part in your class hello can you hear me Sharika Sir, can you repeat please again? So, did I discuss up to this in no. your class today? Did I discuss this thing up to this in your class? Or someone from section 1, please response. Hello. Uh, relationship. Yes, sir. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, oh, sir. No, we can hear you. All right, so I, I'm asking you that, Sharika, did I discuss this thing in yes, your class yes. today? Yes, sir. Oh, that's great. From the section one and someone from section 25, did I discuss this thing up to in your class? Yes, someone please respond from section 25. Sir, I don't think we have done work for, uh, for our section. Uh, we have written the uh, rule actually. Which one? Up to this? Uh, torque one. Torque one? Yes, sir. I didn't prove that part. No, sir. Oh, sir, you only gave us the equation. You didn't. After that, we didn't learn anything. The linear equation and the rotational equation you have given as a chart. So there you have written it. Oh, all right. That's great. So that's very difficult. But sir, in your class, you have proved the. Uh, this part, uh, right? Yes, sir. I can see your screen. Yeah, I'm not sharing. sharing. Yeah, I'm. Going, I'm not okay. sharing. You see. Because okay. there are some network issues from my side also. So. Okay, so you have proved that uh, formula already in our section one. Yeah, now can can you see see it? Yes, sir. Yeah, that's great. Yes. All right, let's start actually. So, whatever we talk about, basically. Uh, So I say that uh, this one torque actually net torque would be basically uh, I into alpha. It can be proved actually. 
so I'm not going to going for to prove that one if you uh, from the section 5 if you ask for that one I'll do in your uh, class actually if you want actually but let's keep it up to that this can be proved because, because I'm not going to give you any proof in your exam but those thing I show in your class so that you can understand where those equation are coming from so that's why I show you in that class all right so let's go to our next part actually which is I didn't talk about in your class probably in both section which is actually that uh, angular momentum so angular momentum so angular momentum is defined for a point mass actually we express by that l is basically r cross p that's the definition of that angular momentum of a point particle where r is actually the location of your particle and p is the momentum of the particle you are measuring that momentum from somewhere your origin and that's r indicating the position of your particle from your origin let's say i have a arbitrary shape of shape of object this object i can rotate by in different direction or is rotating about that plane actually let's say at a angular velocity omega then all the particle inside that object is rotating with the same angular speed which is omega over here but if i consider a point let's say i choose my origin is over there so i choose uh, let's say different color let's say this is my origin this is my x axis this is my let's say this is x axis this is y axis and let's say this is actually the z axis i choose a point particle over here so let's say this is the particle so and this is that mass is i particle then this particle has at a distance let's say this is that r that's the location of this i particle and since it's at a mass it has also some linear velocity which is would be tangential to the path that i say that the vi and this angle is 90 degree over here remember because that velocity is always tangential to the path if the system is moving we can consider that particle also move in a circular track over here right in that circular path then this velocity would be tangential to the path it means that r and v would be basically perpendicular to each other over here because it's moving at the same angular speed fine then i can write this angular momentum for this i particle i'm supposed to write it should be l i must be equal to r i cross m i v i right can i write this equation yes, sir fine so then i am going to also write down the, i'm going to replace this thing over here because i can write this v actually or the you can take the magnitude of this part because you know that r and v actually perpendicular uh, uh, perpendicular to each other that's why angle is 90 then i'm supposed to write the magnitude would be l would be r i m i into v i because angle is 90 degrees so it's a cross product so this magnitude into sine 90 so sine 90 would be 1 so that's why I drop that vector sign over here then I can plug in that value of this vi because I know that although the all the particle inside that object has a different linear speed that I can write down this vi would be basically omega into ri because if a particle is over here let's say the particle is over there another particle then it has this is would be r j and it r is different over here but the angular velocity is same all the particles so that's why i can find out this is would be the velocity of that particle which is the j and this is would be r j different particle has a different linear speed over here because this r is changing over here all right then I can plug in that part over here V would be basically omega into Ri that's mean this Li would be sh should be Mi Ri square into omega 
right? Let me just therefore. So this would be actually that angular momentum of that point particle which is that particle over here. So now if you want to find out the total angular momentum of this system, you will simply add all the particle or you can basically uh, sum up all the particle over here to find out the total angular momentum. In term of that one I can write, let us say it should be I 1 2 n which is L i and the L i I can replace I 1 2 n the system has a nth particle, then this is m i r i square into omega. Now, this thing is moment of inertia of the system, right? m i r i square that is the total moment of inertia of that system because it has i th nth particle into the system. So, that is why this is the total moment of inertia of this object. Then I can write this angular momentum for this system is going to be i omega that is not actually that also that angular momentum of the system. Alright, let us say I define that angular momentum of the system L actually R cross P, right? Or simply I can write this is R cross M V. Now, I am going to take the derivative of that function with respect to that t. So, if I take that function or mathematical operator d over dt which is r cross mv, I have to use the uv formula over here. If I apply uv formula, what I am going to get from here? I am going to get, so I will take the derivative of the first function, then I will keep that second function intact and the second time I will keep the first function intact and I will take the derivative of the second function. So, that means I will write down this equation in a form dr over dt cross mv. I take the derivative of the first function keeping the second function intact plus second time I will keep the first function intact and I will take that derivative of the second function which is d over dt mv, right? I just simply extend that uv formula for this one. Then what I can write, I can write dl over dt. What it will give me? dr over dt is going to give me basically the velocity because r is the position I say it is over here. So, if you take the rate of change of position with respect to time that will give you basically the velocity. So, this is should be mv plus r into over here, I know m is constant. If I again use the uv formula for m and v, I will find out the m is 0 because m is constant. Then I can keep that intact. Then dv over dt over here, right? Let us write one more line. So, I can write dl over dt. So, I can write this m from there. It should be v cross v plus r cross m into what is dv over dt that will give me basically that acceleration right now what will give me this v cross v what is the value of v cross v can someone tell me what will be the value of v cross v sir <coughs> Sir, how can we uh, write the m outside the bracket? I did not understand. Go to the vector, vector chapter. There is a law I use for the vector, whether you can remember, I do not know actually. Is I multiply a cross n into b. Can you remember that property? I write m n into a cross b. Can you recall that properties of the vector? Hmm? That's a yes, sir, but in this yeah. case. Yes, go ahead. There is no m before the first v. So what? There is a 1. 
let's say there is the in front of one so if we take this m out hmm. uh, there should be oh so, uh, yes sir i got it yeah and now tell me what be that v cross v is it zero what is zero you're mm -hmm. right your answer is absolutely right v cross v mm -hmm. okay. uh sin zero degree actually yeah sin zero degree zero yeah exactly you're right so the angle between these two vectors is zero right so so that's why it should be basically the zero over here then i'm supposed to write this would be r cross f now what is r cross f Torque, this is a torque, right? So that's called actually the torque. We define this thing. So that's mean this equation is telling you that if you want to change that uh, angular momentum of the system, you have to apply some torque on the system. That's why we write this is also net torque actually would be del L over del T. It look like the same thing for the linear case. We write in that case net external force actually del p over del t right can you recall that one i just talk about in that your previous uh, lecture previous lecture means that last week i already talked about this case actually so this was actually that's mean if you want to change the linear momentum of the system you have to apply a external force if you want to change that angular momentum of the system you have to apply a torque on the system because torque is basically the twisting force i say to you that part which is actually apply on the system to rotate the system so that's why it's talk that twisting force so if i say that if i say that net torque is equal to the zero then what will happen i can say in that case del l is going to be the zero right del l zero means then i can say del lf minus li equal to the zero then it should be L i equal to that L f. So, that means initial angular momentum must be equal to the final angular momentum. That is not actually the conservation of the angular momentum. This is called actually conservation of angular momentum. This will be conserved the angular momentum if your torque on the system is 0. Then we can write down same, this thing in the, another way. Actually, I can write, I know that angular momentum equal to Li, right? We know this part. Then I am supposed to write, this would be Ii, which is the initial moment of inertia of the system. This is the initial velocity, must be equal to If into omega F. That's actually known as conservation of angular momentum. And most of the case, actually, this I, I equal to would be I, F. So that's mean initial moment of inertia would be equal to the final moment of inertia of the system. It's most of the case, actually, because unless you do not change that mass and the rotational axis, the moment of inertia of the system is not going to change at all. So that's why sometimes we will find out this equation to solve that, to find out that uh, conservation of angular momentum of the system. And remember, we say if there is net force on the system is zero, we say the system is in equilibrium, right? Equilibrium. The system would be in equilibrium if the net force is zero over here. But the second case, if we say if the net torque is zero on the system, then the system would be basically static equilibrium. This call actually static equilibrium why because when the let's say uh, i have a sheet of paper which is kept on the tabletop then if i apply some force onto the top of the paper the table will also apply some force on the paper right or any box you can say then the net force on the system is zero this means it's not moving but it can be rotated actually right at the same point without uh, changing its uh, center of mass of the system it can be rotated so that's mean in that case we cannot say that 
this paper or this box will be statically equilibrium. But if you say if the net torque is zero, then it cannot be moved at all. So that's mean it will be totally equilibrium. That's known actually that static static equilibrium. That's the condition actually that is static equilibrium. If the net torque and the net force is zero on the system, then we say that the system will be totally static equilibrium, and that's known actually that static equilibrium on the condition of the system. All right, let's consider a case like that. Let's say I have a system which is actually like that. Uh, let me I'll have to draw that one. all these things. So let's say this is actually uh, a wall. I keep a ladder over here. Somehow I keep it over here. The say that. This ladder has a weight which is mg actually 200 Newton and its center of gravity which is at point 0.4L of this ladder. That's the information actually given over here. Now if you want to keep that ladder in that way this ladder will try to fall to the downward direction right this one will be fall to the downward and this side will move towards that direction actually so if you want to keep it over there then this floor must be provide some frictional force so that it cannot be uh, slip down actually so that's why uh, if you draw that free body diagram they ask you actually how large frictional force must be ex apply over here so that the ladder is not to slip And second question they ask you, so that's when I have to find out this uh, first question they ask you, what is the frictional force must be provided over here? Static frictional force basically, I'm sorry, not that kind of frictional force. So it is stationary. So what is the static frictional force must be applied by the floor so that the ladder is not going to slip? Second one. What is that coefficient of static frictional force between the ladder and the surface or the floor? And third one is what are the normal force provided by that surface of these two surfaces? One is from the floor, another is from this wall actually. We are going to find out that one. Normal forces say that uh, Fn1 and I'll say that Fn2. These are the two normal forces. I'll try to draw over here to find out those things. Alright, let's draw the free body diagram. Can you tell me how many force would be over here to draw the free body diagram of this system? Try to understand. How many forces should I draw over here? Hmm? Can you tell me how many forces should I draw over here? All right, so I'm just, uh, telling you. So one force would be gravitational force, right? Which is actually 
200 Newton of this ladder of this so that's when which is the weight of this ladder and one force would be your normal force provided by this surface on the ladder it should be let's say this is Fn1 Th there will be one more normal force in that direction which would be Fn2 and there would be one more force this is actually that Fs frictional force you understand these are the force will be acting on over here all right yes sir fine now they asked me to calculate actually this frictional force and this normal reaction force and also that coefficient of static friction if you can find out that fs you can will be able to find out basically your uh, coefficient of static friction all right so if i want to find out over here what i'm going to do i'll write that since it's not moving it is stationary i'm supposed to say that net force along to the x direction is zero and also the net force along to the y direction would be also zero over here let's choose this is my positive x direction and this is my positive y direction right since i want to keep that ladder is fixed so that's when it's not moving for that one how much frictional force should be supplied by the surface on the ladder that's mean it is must be the stationary if it is stationary then i can say the net force is zero if the net force is zero then i'm supposed to say that also the net force along to the x direction would be zero and net force along to the y direction would be also zero over here all right fine then i can find out this what are the forces along to the x direction over here if you look at this uh, there are two forces. one is this one uh, i'm supposed to write net force summation of the net force along to the x direction is zero means i'm supposed to write it should be uh, fn1 sorry fn2 fn2 that's the normal force provided by this one minus f of s equal to the zero right these are the two force along to my x direction over here all right then what would be this fn2 fn2 would be basically your fs this is one equation actually so that's mean if i know that fs it should be the fn2 or if i know that fn that should be the fs over here my job would be to find out that fn2 all right now find out that fn1 if you write down the net force along to the y axis is zero then what are the forces along to the y axis there are two forces one is the fn1 towards the positive y direction and 200 newton towards that negative y direction then i'll write down it should be fn1 minus 200 must be equal to the zero then i'll find out simply this would be fn1 would be basically 200 newton so this is actually the normal force on that provided by that wall on the ladder fine now in the first question they asked me basically to find out this fs so that's when if you somehow can find out the fn2 you'll be able to find out that fs because that's actually equal force over here all right to find out that fn i already find out i use my that part actually the net force is zero there's since it's a static equilibrium i will use the second equation when that net torque on the system would be also the zero since it's a totally static equilibrium i will apply the torque on the system about this point which is i'll choose over here about that point let's say this is the point a i'm applying the torque on that ladder about this point right all right so there is one more information actually the given which i miss so this let's say this ladder create an angle with that surface which is actually 50 degree Now I am going to apply the torque on the ladder about the point, let me allow to copy this figure then it will be I think it will be easier for you to understand. Go 
copy over here. Yeah, that's great. All right, so I will apply the torque on the system about that point. So I will write down net torque on the system about the point A equal to the 0 and I will say that counterclockwise torque is basically the positive, right? I discussed this thing in your class. That is the convention actually. They follow the counterclockwise torque is positive and the clockwise torque would be negative. All right, let us start for the F N 1. So the, the formula I am going to use over here torque actually that R F into sin theta. This is the formula I am using for calculating the torque on the system and the counterclockwise torque is positive. I will consider and the clockwise torque would be negative. I will also follow that convention over here. Fine. So, first one and this is the net torque on the system would be also the 0 because the total system S is basically over here is static equilibrium. So, that is why I can say that the net torque on the system must be going to the 0. I am writing this equation over here. All right, let us calculate the torque. So, first one I am calculating for this F n 1, then I am supposed to write this is my force which is F, I am supposed to write that a little bit lower. Let's write it over here. Say F n 1 into 0, right? Because I choose my origin over here. From my origin, the position of that force actually the 0 plus same thing I will write F s into the 0. Can I write? Minus because this one for this force, the system will move towards the clockwise direction in that direction. So, that is why I will write down 200, this is the force into that displacement because they uh, say that the torque actually or that weight on the ladder is acting at 0.4 or center of gravity of the ladder actually the 0.4 of the L. So, I will write down that should be my R over here. So, into uh, point 4 into L and the angle is sin, look at this, this one is 50 degree, this angle is 90 degree, then it is supposed to be 40 degree over here, right? Then I am supposed to write this would be sin 40 plus Fn2, Fn2 that is the force and its length that force actually at a length L from your origin or from your point actually from there this is the length and what is the angle this is would be the angle over here because this is actually your length from your origin which is actually that L and that is the force which is Fn2 and that angle would be this is the angle. I said when you calculate the torque, actually, you are writing torque actually R F sin theta. Theta is the angle between your displacement or the position and the force, actually. So that is why that angle would be over here and it is going to be the 50 basically because this Fn1 and Fs actually that parallel line. So this is going to be the alternative angle. Then I am supposed to write this would be sin 50 degree must be equal to that 0. Let's remove this part. Sir, can you explain uh, why um, did you write F n uh, into zero, F n one into zero? All right. So when I'm writing this torque formula, this is the torque R cross F, right? This R actually the position of your force from your sir is it for 90 degree angle which one uh, uh no 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 sir you can explain continue so remember when we write that formula torque actually in a form r cross f that's mean that the position of the force 
at a distance r from your origin from your origin mean from your point where you consider the calculate the torque actually i said when the system actually that we this is actually the rotating about this point if you apply the force over here then this is actually your r and this is the force so that's mean this is that r is locating that position of your force from your origin i said when i'm talking about this thing actually that's why i proved that equation actually the torque formula it is very important i said you you have to remember the two point actually where you are applying the force from your origin from your uh, rotational point and which direction you are applying your force this two point is very important for calculating the torque actually when i am uh, look at this in this situation i say i am calculating the torque about this point this is my point right which i say that this is the a actually over here now and that point is also the fn1 is acting so that's mean from this point the location of the force f1 is zero am i right Oh, okay, so and then and from this point. yeah, that's also true for FS. That's why I give you that zero over there. Okay. okay. Yeah. Oh, it's not working. All right, we can move forward. That's great. So now we can write down. Look at this. This one can be written as a form. Actually, if you multiply, this will be basically you can do that calculation. Actually, it should be 51.42L must be equal to 0.76L into Fn2 because that is a minus sign. So I keep it into that side actually. So then I can drop this L. I can find out this fn2 which would be from that part actually you will find out this fn2 is going to be that 67.65 newton so that should be that normal reaction force provided by that wall on to that ladder and this would be also your uh, fs right because we find out fs from this equation would be fn2 then i can say this is would be that uh, answer of the first question because in the first question they asked me to find out fs then I can say that Fs would be basically Fn2, which is basically 67.65 Newton. So this is the answer of your first question. And the second one, they asked me actually to find out the coefficient, to calculate the coefficient of a static friction. So that's when I can find out Fs would be mu s into n. Now what would be that mu s over here? So, mu s would be, now what would be the n over here? That's the very important part. Is, should it be fn1 or fn2? So fn2. fn2, sir. Why did fn2? Because the friction is for the fn2, not the fn1. Why is the friction is acting on the ladder? Why is your frictional force? Uh, sir, if it uh, basically uh, x uh, is going for x axis. Yes. Look at yeah, this. that's why we choose uh, f n. No, that's not the point because the point is basically look at this. This is actually your f s over here. F s is over here. Yes. Then the frictional force would be over here. Then the normal force uh, I should contact the f n one. Why well, choose the Fn2 over but here? Fn, Fn2 and Fs are parallel. They are the same. They are the same force. Right. The frictional force actually acting on that, that part. If there is a friction, if I draw, then that would be also the coefficient of static friction you can find out. Right. If that material and that material are same, then coefficient would be the same. So let's say if that part, I consider this is a frictionless because I do not draw any frictional force over here. So, so what is the direction of the frictional force over here? In that case, this frictional force must be in that direction. 
f s let us say this is would be f s 1 in that case and then and it would be f s 2. Right now this let us keep it simple as much as possible. It is supposed to be f n 1 over here not the f n 2. That is why I will write this one going to be normal force if I want to write it should be mu s into f n 1 then mu s going to be f s divided by f n 1 and f s actually the f n 2 right. So, this is actually f n 2 divided by f n 1 you will find out in that case it is going to be that 0.33. So, that is the answer of the question number 2 and you can find out the third one they are asked to calculate that uh, normal reaction force which is f n 1 and f n 2 you already find out that one right. So, your f n 1 your f n 1 should be uh, how much f n 1 is actually 67 point no no, no the f n 1 is actually 200 Newton and f n 2 actually 67.65 Newton. So, that would be actually the answer of this question. All right, is there any question over here? Is there any question over here? Come on guys. Sir, I still did not get no. that. Which one? Sir, why is the F N 1 working for the free F S? All right, so let us see. Let us say you keep a block onto the surface and you are dragging this one right in that direction. Then the when the friction is acting on that, you take the normal reaction force for that surface this is actually normal reaction force this is actually your mg this is actually your frictional force over here it should be the fk actually over here because it's moving if you drag so let's say it's moving actually then we find out that frictional force in the way we write fk it should be mu k into n that normal reaction force is directly connected to the frictional surface. Am I right? Yes, sir. I get it now. Thank uh, you. All right. That's great. All right. Is there any more question? No, sir. Is there any more question from any of you? No, sir. All right, that's great. Thank you very much, guys. That's enough for today, actually. <laughs> it is already one hour. I said you, I do not take more than one hour. Thank you very much for your support. And I did actually one problem. I will try one or, one or two more problems from this chapter. Then I will move forward to the next chapter, actually. And what I will do, I will do some uh, recorded uh, problem or problem solving video. Then I will upload into actually the YouTube. You can access from, you will from that YouTube channel actually. Then I think it would be helpful for you because right now I do not want to uh, linger this class. It would be really tough because you guys are, uh, I know you guys are very much disturbed uh, on me because I arranged this one. There is no other option because I am telling you that thing in the class I said you and I am telling you anyway. except this I do not have any other option because I am too busy in the Monday and the Wednesday actually. I have three classes tomorrow. So, which is very tough to talk uh, to arrange another class actually after that. And I, I, I actually I am also fed up to take the three class in a one day. I do not want to take this class one more class extra class into uh, working day. So, that is why I arrange this class. Thank you very much guys. You can leave right now. Sir, is there any conflict?